here is Anne Rice, who <laughs> we've worked together. Yes. We've worked together for many, many years, and we have a very special relationship. And we've had conversations over the years, lots of them about all kinds of subjects, but it's great to be able to have a sort of formal uh, conversation with you. And, you know, I think it's interesting. Tell us a little bit how you came to write about Lestat again. Oh, how I came to write about him now, uh, again? Well, this was a character that basically came to life for me in 1974 when I wrote my first novel, Interview with the Vampire. And it was a character that I didn't pay very much attention to at that time. The hero of the book was Louis, the vampire who was telling the story of what it was like to be immortal and to be losing his humanity bit by bit. And Lestat was the antagonist. He was the villain, the guy that had um, rushed Louis and made him a vampire almost against his will. And Lestat just somehow took on a life of his own, as the cliche goes, and he became um, eventually the hero of a, an entire series of books. But it was nine years after Interview with the Vampire that I published the first book that was really Lestat's book, and it was The Vampire Lestat. And I identified with Lestat by that time much, much more than I identified with Louis. And Lestat became, really launched for me what became The Vampire Chronicles. I, I think it was Vicky who, who named it, actually, The Vampire Chronicles. I, I was going to call it The Stories of the Vampires. And Vicky <laughs> changed it to The Vampire Chronicles, which was good, which was good. And um, I came back to him with this book because I missed him. I missed him completely. And I had taken a vacation of about 10 years from, from him and from the Chronicles. And in the interim, a whole lot of new ideas had come to me, a lot of new questions about what he'd be doing and what he'd be saying and so forth and so on. So I had to go back to him. And I'm very glad I did. And yeah. we're all glad that you did. Yeah. Thank you. Talk a little bit about how you name your characters, how you study and combine names, the sounds of the names, and, and what that means to you, such as Lestat. Or... Well, Lestat's a made-up name. There was no such name. I actually thought I was using an old Louisiana name, but I was misspelling it. The old name is Leston, L-E-S-T-A-N. And there were quite a few Lestons in Creole, Louisiana, French history. And I'm, but I just, again, I misspelled it, and so I inadvertently created a name that didn't exist, which I think was really good luck, because it's <laughs> unique. It's unique, but I didn't realize it for several years that I had made a mistake. And, of course, Lestat was, in a large measure, um, inspired by my husband, Stan. So possibly there was some slip there, you know, that it was mm -hmm. Lestan, but I couldn't face it, so it became Lestat. But in any event, now people are naming their children Lestat. Oh, my God. And for years, they have named their pets Lestat. So I think Alice Cooper, the singer, was the first one I heard of who named his German Shepherd Lestat. I was completely honored. But now it's kids. Now it's kids. And uh, I'm thrilled by all that. Pretty soon it will be buildings. What? Pretty soon it will be buildings. <laughs> Well, there is a club, there is a coffee shop named Lestat in San Diego. Yeah, but so. I mean, in terms of like Memnock and Taltos, how do you talk a little bit about oh, how you? Oh, you know, the word the words are like gems to me, and I sort of collect words and terms like Taltos. Um, that was a term I found in a book about folklore, um, and uh, I, I I made the Taltos a certain species of creature immortal pretty near immortal, that, that lived in, in the primal time and on the earth and survived as, as a sort of remnant race. But I, I picked up the name from, a, uh, I think, a Carlo Ginsberg book on, on folklore. And it meant something else in the book. The Tautos is a specific kind of creature, mm. supernatural being. But I changed it. But I collect names all the time. I, um, I jot down names in the back of the books I read. And it's very important for me when I when I feel a new character coming on, when I'm getting involved with that character, I have to have the name for that character. I really do. Or I can't go forward with the story. Hmm. So it, it's getting harder and harder after 40 years to come up with new names. <laughs> All my favorite names have long been exhausted. You've invented them. 
Well, but I, there, but you'll invent others. I, I guess so, but I, I've also used a lot of names I loved, like Richard and Michael and uh, Louis and Armand and, uh, gosh, I don't know, Marius, things like that. But uh, the names really do matter to me. Again, they're like gems. They're almost like if you imagine yourself walking through a very shallow stream and you're picking up beautiful stones that catch your eye, you know, mm -hmm. that have been smoothed by the water. It's, that's what names are like for me. Mm. That's a great description. Um, you know, the other day we were talking in uh, Philadelphia, and you mentioned, you know, that you had this idea about, you know, to, to come up with, uh, you were thinking about writing about vampires. But I, at that point, I thought, and I meant to ask you this, what were you thinking about writing before you were thinking about writing about vampires? Well, I was going through a period in 1972 or three where I, I wanted to be a writer. And uh, after everything was done in the house and it was quiet and peaceful and I didn't have any more work to do for my college classes, I would try to write a short story every night, maybe 15 or 30 pages. Mm. And I, I type very fast and I, I write sort of in a spontaneous flow. And I was really just doing what people would call pedestrian realism stories. And they had gay themes, some of them, and some of them, um, they had one or two were surreal, but, but there was no, there was, it was not really working for me very well. And I had been working on a novel as my thesis at San Francisco State in creative writing, a novel called Catherine and Jean, and it was just a total mess. It had been pulled in so many directions by so many different discussions and, and, and reconsiderations that it, it just wasn't working anymore. It, it was realism, but it really wasn't realism. It was heavily romantic, and um, the main character was this young man, Jean, who was very, very beautiful and was a male prostitute. And um, that novel never really came, and it, well, it was my thesis, and I did get my MA in creative writing, and it's somewhere in the library at San Francisco State, but it never really became a novel. And it was during that time that I wrote the short story uh, interview with the vampire, and it was just a whim to see what I could do with that theme. And I'm not sure what inspired it or why it came into my mind at that time. I don't remember seeing any particular film at that time or reading anything at that time. I, I just had the idea. What if you could get a vampire to really open up to you and tell you what it was really like to do what he does? And um, I took the story out a couple of times over the years after that to revise it. And each time it changed somewhat. And the last time I took it out to revise it, it began to grow into the novel. And suddenly the vampire had a name, he was Louis, and the vampire who made him a vampire was Lestat, and suddenly it was just off and running. And I had a, a feeling of just um, electric intensity I had never experienced before. I felt like I had found something that was so exciting to do. I, I just, I couldn't, couldn't explain it. And I just went with it and finished the first draft in a very short time. It was about 350 pages. And I remember the night I finished it, I thought, this, I'm going to publish this. If I have to do it myself, if I have to mimeograph it, you know, this was a long time ago, and if, you know, or Xerox it and sell it out of a shopping bag on Fifth Avenue in New York, I'm going to do it. And it's going to be my first published novel, I know that. And it turned out that nine months later, the novel, which I had started to send out to people, um, fell into the hands of Vicki Wilson, who was 23 at the time, working for Knopf, a young editor, and she wanted to publish it. And my whole world changed at that moment. And you know, I've never really discussed this. I, mean, I guess I've never really said this before, but you know, my world changed too. <laughs> and. Um, my world, my whole sort of career has been shaped in a way by this relationship. And uh, so it works, it works, it's a two-way thing. Well, I, 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 that's wonderful of you to say that, but I know you've published many other writers and many other books. I do, I publish years. many, many other writers, but I mean, there aren't too many people who, in fact, nobody who I've had this 40-year relationship 40 with. 40 years, yeah of working together and really seeing, of growing up together, really, mm -hmm. and of living exactly. life together, yeah. and of seeing how the writing, your writing has changed as your life has changed. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think we may have the longest relationship right now. 
in New York publishing. Yeah, right? I don't there think is there, nobody else. I don't think them. there's anything that yeah. comes close. And you know, it used to be that that, I mean, there are many writers who we publish at Knopf and who I publish what I've worked with for maybe 25 or 30 years. But mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating because the writing changes as, as life intervenes. Mm -hmm. Well, you've always been open to the changes, and you've always been um, willing to follow me or let me go in another direction. You've always been completely open to that. And, and uh, there was only one instance where you said this book was something you really couldn't publish, and that was My Erotica by Anne Urquhart, which is understandable. It's flagellation S&M erotica. And Vicky just said, <laughs> Vicky just said, I. I, I don't know, you know, I don't get it, right? <laughs> well, I just said, no, I said, I, I can't, I feel like I'm in an airless room and I can't breathe, so I cannot deal with S&M porn. <laughs> yeah. and, and, of course, it's all about domination. Call me old-fashioned, but what can I say? Well, it was about domination and submission, and you said, if I were to publish it, all the slaves would have to want to be free. And I said, they don't want to be free. <laughs> this is this is S&M erotica, they want to be slaves. Right. And you said, well... I, I can't do it. But you sent me to the person, Bill Whitehead at Dutton, who subsequently published the Rokalar novels and did a beautiful job of it. And I stayed with you at Knopf for everything else. Exactly. So it, exactly. Worked, it worked out really wonderfully, and that was the one instance, I think. So talk about, work. you know, your husband, Stan Rice, was a very, was an acclaimed poet mm -hmm. and a wonderful man, a really extraordinary man, loving man. And talk about how he, if he did, influenced your work and how you evolved together as writers. Well, I, I don't know that, you know, Stan said things that loomed large in my mind, and he would influence my work in that way. Or I would go to a, a poetry reading that he was doing, and I would hear the rhythms of his poems, and they would influence my work. But he never tried in any direct way. Mm -hmm. to influence no. my work. In fact, he didn't understand a lot of it. He really didn't. But he did very much understand the Vampire Chronicles, and he was always most fervent about them. You know, now, I did a, another entire series, the Witching Hour books, about the Mayfair family, and he didn't like them at all, really. I mean, he acknowledged that they were, I think he thought they were adequately written, but I mean, he had no interest in them, and he didn't like them. So there were subjects that he didn't respond to, but he was always the first person to whom I took the finished manuscript, and he would give it a very um, objective reading. I mean, he never had a, a thought in his head about what might be commercial or non-commercial. He, he lived completely in the world of poetry and painting. And he would just read that manuscript, and then he would come back with an opinion or a response, and it would frequently teach me a lot. And a lot of times, I never changed anything in the manuscript based on what he said. Sometimes I did, actually. But a lot of times, I just listened, and I learned from it, and I developed. It was like an ongoing conversation. Um, we were married 41 years, and uh, it, was, it was quite an incredible relationship. And, and he, he and I sort of lived and breathed writing together. It was the most important thing to us, our writing, our work. And our son, Christopher, grew up in that atmosphere, knowing that that was what we cared about more than, more than material possessions or any, any other value, really. So it was, it was a very wonderful and sometimes very stormy love affair because Stan was very, very different from me. I, I was a Catholic from New Orleans, uh, from the Irish background, and, and Stan is, was from Texas, and really from sort of a prairie and farm background. Hmm. And he was a Protestant, if he was anything. He was really an atheist, and uh, so ardent about being an atheist that I used to call him my Bible Belt atheist because it's such a non-belief in God. <laughs> you know, he didn't believe in anything supernatural. But it really was a great relationship, and he was very, very supportive of my work. And I remember giving him the manuscript of Interview with the Vampire, which I had written in all-night sessions. And I went to sleep in the morning, and then he woke me up that afternoon and said that it was terrific. It was mm. absolutely terrific. And he read the whole thing in one sitting, and I never forgot that experience. I trusted him completely. I really did. And tell me about how your work separately evolved but together as two people who were joined by this 
love of writing? Well, his, his world was a world of poetry writing and poetry, and he was a very effective reader of his work. And um, he became a teacher at San Francisco State early on, and then he became chairman of the department, which I think almost killed him. Uh, he, was, he was very unhappy as chairman, but it was a department in which almost anybody, any of the writers or poets, uh, would. They, any of them were unhappy as chairman. It was like a monastery where everybody has come to pray and to chant Gregorian chant and to work in the garden, and somebody has to be the superior and has to be busy with work. And when he was chosen as that reluctant one, uh, it was very hard for him to be chairman. But he, he did finish out at, at San Francisco State as the chairman. And we went south. It was a very big, dramatic thing for us. He had taught at State for years didn't want to lose tenure, um, very much felt a man's a need to be the support of his family and to supply the medical insurance and so forth. And I really wanted to go home to the South, and I wanted, especially as a writer, to go home to the South. And he finally agreed to take a sabbatical and to go down South, and this was a big deal. Uh, and my writing changed for the better. Um, that's when I wrote the Witching Hour books. And he fell in love with New Orleans, and he gave up uh, his job at that point, which took a lot of courage, you know, to take early retirement and mm -hmm. trust that I would be able to um, provide, you know, for us. And he became a painter at that point, and he painted something like 300 canvases before he died uh, in 2002. He died very suddenly. He got a brain tumor. And one minute he was a completely healthy man, and four and a half months later he was gone, just gone. And it left all of us kind of utterly stunned, you know, just stunned, like what had happened. I mean, we could hardly believe it. It was so sudden. And of course, it was for me um, devastating. I mean, 41 years we had sat down to dinner together no matter what happened, you know, every night. We slept in the same bed every night. We'd been together. It was, it was 41 years, and then suddenly he was gone into the biggest mystery, I guess, we ever confront in this world. And I wasn't gone with him, you know, he was gone. It was quite a shock. It took me, took me a number of years to get over that, and I think one reason I didn't write about Lestat for a long time was that he was associated so much in my mind with Stan that I mm -hmm. couldn't. Mm -hmm. And how did, you, um, how did you work when, as you, in your writing, when you, as a wife and a mother? How did I work? How did you, how did you parse out your time? Well, uh, now that in a way sounds like a sexist question, no, no, and in a way no. it is. No, I because didn't, why should you yeah. be doing this? But well, we both we life both, was yeah. We worked our way through college, and we both we both worked a lot of jobs, you know. And then when we did have a child, uh, Michelle, when she was born, I did stay home with Michelle more than Stan did. He he was teaching at that point at San Francisco State, and I was required to be at home. But I had a lot of time to write at home. You know, take, I was still going to college. I was still taking classes, but I was able to do it. Um, I was able to write, take care of her, go to classes two or three days a week. It wasn't difficult. It really wasn't. It was pretty conventional in terms of his being the breadwinner, and I wasn't the breadwinner. And then um, after Michelle died, um, I had, I guess, I, yeah, I had my master's degree by then, but. I, I went back to work, and I was very unhappy at the jobs I had. And at that point, he said, you know, you, I'm really making quite a bit more than you're making, so why don't you just stay home and write? Mm -hmm. He actually said that. Just stay home. I'll, I'll, I'll pay the bills, you know. Uh, and I wrote an interview with the vampire when he said that. And so that was a great act of faith on his part. But uh, we had, like I said, we had both worked many jobs before. You know, we'd done a lot. And... Uh, I think in many ways he, he was uh, way ahead of his time, you know, and, and, it, and our marriage was a very special kind of relationship, special kind of love affair where the roles weren't all that conventional and we balanced each other in certain ways. And we had very stormy arguments. People were always thinking we were on the verge of divorce, you know, because we would, we would get into an argument over the nature of sense of humor, you know, and heavy door slamming and just talking off. Or we'd go see a movie, and I'd say, that's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. And he would get up and say, I don't even want to know anybody who thinks that's a good movie. And it was almost like walk to separate aisles to walk out of the theater. 
That movie, by the way, was all that jazz, actually. It's Bob Fosse. I thought it was a masterpiece, and he thought it was awful. But I'm with Stan on that. <laughs> uh, well, you were with Stan on a lot of things. I was. I love Stan's paintings, and yeah. I published a book of his paintings. That yes, was, you did. That was yeah. great. I just I thought he was fantastic. Yeah. And he was self-taught. He was. He was. He, he had a great eye. but self-taught. Yeah. yeah. He had been all over the world looking at paintings right. and studying. I mean, he, what he did, he wasn't know. unsophisticated, but he wasn't, a, he wasn't a trained painter. No, and he called himself a post-primitive. Yeah. And he was, yeah. exactly. Right. You know, um, you mentioned at some point that you had read uh, Lewis Wallace's novel, Ben-Hur. And yeah. Wallace was a really interesting man, if you don't know who he was. He was a lawyer. He was a union general in the Civil War. He was a thousand things. He was a territorial governor, a politician. Anyway, his Ben-Hur has been called the most influential Christian book of the 19th century. Right, yeah. So talk a bit about when you read that and what... Well, I, I was when I wrote Christ the Lord out of Egypt. Uh, it, this was the first novel I wrote from the point of view of the child Jesus as a little seven and eight-year-old eight, eight -year -old boy. And I wanted very, very much... Uh, I was studying the Bible studying scripture, studying biblical scholars, and reading quite a bit of scholarship. And I wanted very much to know how authors before had dealt with Christian novels. And uh, I got into Lou Wallace, just reading his life and reading what he accomplished with Ben-Hur. And what I discovered was that um, he had written in Ben-Hur a Christian novel that was in no way anti-Semitic. And we had just been through the publication of The Passion of the Christ. I mean, not the publication, but the movie of The Passion of the Christ by uh, Mel Gibson. And there had been a lot of talk about how anti-Semitic it was and whether anti-Semitism was rooted in the Gospels themselves. And I'd gone back and read uh, Lloyd C. Douglas's The Robe, and I'd seen certain elements in that book that could be seen as almost routinely anti-Semitic. So I was very interested in Ben-Hur and Lou Wallace because I felt, how could he do that? Well, he did do it. He created this great Jewish family Ben-Hur's family, and he created with great respect uh, a great hero who was in fact a Jew and who saw Jesus only once in the novel. And it was just a remarkable, wonderful novel that actually brought Jews and Christians together when it was published. They both read it, and the movie versions have always brought a Jewish and Christian audience together. And I, 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 want, I set out to, uh, in my own small way, with, with my small novel about Jesus, to do the same thing, and he was very much an inspiration. He had been in Turkey for a long time. I think he'd been an ambassador or mm -hmm. some sort of con at the council, and he had a great respect for uh, the East and, and, and the Semitic peoples and, and Jewish religion and even Muslim religion, all of it, and his respect way outweighed any anti-Semitic ideas that he might have had. He just didn't have them, and that's how he was able to achieve what he achieved. Um, Last night, I got the word that the movie based on my book, Christ, Christ the Lord Out of Egypt, has just finished uh, filming in Rome. It's just done. And I got a wonderful, exhausted letter from the uh, director, Cyrus Narasta, that they had wrapped. And this gives me great happiness that this movie is finished. Now, of course, they have to go on and edit it, and they have to go on and put the music and do all of it and really make it into the movie that will go into theaters in 2016. But I'm hoping and praying above all that the movie does what I wanted it to do in presenting Jesus as a Jewish boy in a Jewish family, in a Jewish country, in a Jewish time. And I think that they will, and it's a great joy. I didn't know you were going to ask me this about Lou Wallace. It's very timely. Yeah, it's yeah. funny, because, you know, I wonder if his being a union general had any, and bringing Christians and Jews together had anything to do with the fact that he had been this general in the Civil War. I and don't bringing know. the North and the South together. Yeah. I mean, it could have, it's sort of an know. interesting uh, thing to ponder. It might, it, might, it might be. I know that what he did was more unusual than people give him credit for. You know, we just kind of take the movie for granted, Charlton Heston, right. you know, so the chariot race right. is the best scene and all of that. Of course. And it's a big spectacle and it's fun and the silent version was supposed Francis to be even X. better. Bushman. But it, it's amazing what he's doing there with Jews and Christians. It's amazing. It's a novel I've yeah. never read. I think I'm going I'm to read I've it. I've tried to read it. I've read quite a bit of it. But it's a, it, I think it's a dated novel somewhat. Oh, and, sure. Um, 
it's, it's difficult to read. It's not timeless like Dickens. At mm -hmm. least I'm not finding him that way. But in any event, it had a great deal of personal meaning for me. So when you uh, lived in San Francisco, did living there influence your writing, do you think? It must have. It must have in a lot of ways. Uh, San Francisco is such a remarkable city and such an unusual city, but I, I can't point to any specific way that it did. I, I mean, you know, I, I always write so in my imagination. Um, it doesn't almost matter where I am. I, I was in Berkeley when I wrote Interview with the Vampire, but the whole novel set in antebellum New Orleans. And uh, I think what I need for my immediate environment more than anything is peace and quiet, you know, mm -hmm. to get the work done. Right. And a, a sense of safety and a sense of, uh, I guess, being in a, co a comfortable place. You know, like right now I live in the California desert. And I'm not entirely sure that that's home for me, but it's a great place to recollect in tranquility. And uh, I'm there for the sunlight, for the heat, for the uh, quiet, total quiet, really. And I can get into Los Angeles in two hours. And if I have to go there to meet with people in the film industry, I can get there easily enough. And my son, Christopher Rice, lives in West Hollywood, and we're very close. But um, again, I don't know that you know the desert is going to influence me in any specific way. No, but yeah. you know, when you move back to New Orleans, your writing did change it and did. open up yeah. in, a, in a whole other way. And you, that's when you wrote the Mayfair. Yeah, that's is, that's really true. New Orleans continues to be this huge force in my writing, and and I wrote the Witching Hour when I moved back, and it, it it's it, being around, you know, having written interview with the vampire from a position of longing to be in the South. Suddenly I was back in the South and I was overstimulated and just flooded with new words, new images, new colors, new, new responses. And, and I, I, I immediately put my own house that I was living in into the Witching Hour novel. And the novel became sort of a, uh, a love story, uh, a love letter to New Orleans and to my house and to all of the related families that right. I had in right. New Orleans, and, and the Mayfair family kind of became part of that. And Blackwood right. Farm and... Yeah, went on to write Blackwood Farm and put all the country people I knew into right. Blackwood exactly. Farm. Uh, that was a great deal of fun for me. So yeah, that, that it, certainly you're right. I guess what I'm saying is California doesn't seem to influence me that much, except in very specific ways. Well, in a way it did, because it didn't give you what you needed, so you yearned for New Orleans. Yeah. And well, after, after 35 whatever years, cumulatively 40 years of living in California, uh, I finally did write uh, The Wolf Gift, set up in the redwood trees in, right. in, in Mendocino County, was finally able to write about Mendocino and the coast and, and the beauty of the redwood forest and the kind of gothic quality that the redwood forest has. I was able to find something there that was extreme and beautiful. And on the way over, uh, when we were in New Orleans for the little stock ball, recently, and I was telling Anne that I went to the, one of the plantations outside of New Orleans, which was Oak Alley, and you were talking about how it meant so much to you. Why don't you talk a little bit about how, you know, when you first went there and you first saw it and how, you, how it influenced your writing? Well, I was, a, I was still a struggling writer when we went down south for a visit from California, and uh, we went to Oak Alley. It's, it's a place that's open. You can drive up and go through the house, and it's a beautiful plantation house with double galleries running all around it in columns. And uh, it was just part of the enchanting beauty of the South for me. And later on in my books, I did write about it in the Witching Hour books. I, I made it the Talamasca Mother House. The Talamasca is this imaginary order of uh, psychic detectives that are in my novels. And they have mother houses or havens or refuges all over the world. And I described Oak Alley as the place that they had in Louisiana. And uh, it, it's just one of those places that is very much loved by Hollywood. As a matter of fact, they used it in the movie Interview with the Vampire as Louis' plantation house, which was all wrong, actually, chronologically. It's completely wrong. Uh, Louis', Louis plantation would, was a Creole plantation in the 1700s, and it would have looked completely different. It would not have had these massive columns and, or been anything as grand as Oak Alley, but it was fine. I mean, it worked fine in the film. Big plantation, right. ride right. the horse up through the 
Alley of Oaks, you know, it, it was terrific. Oak Alley, I think, was built in 1839, if I remember yeah, the tour yeah. pro correctly. That's what they said. Yeah, and Louis in the novel was living in the seven, late 1700s in a different type of structure. Right, right. Yeah. But, but if you ever have a chance to go, I would recommend it. The trees in front of it and all around it live to be 600 years old. It's a blessed it's place. It's a spectacular place. It really place. is, and, and you can walk out there and look at that literal Alley of Oaks going all the way to the levee, and the river, of course, is right beyond the levee, and it's, it's, it does make you, um, it does give you pause. It's very, very impressive and beautiful place. And years ago, the owner of it tried to donate it to the state of Louisiana, and they wouldn't take it from her. Uh, they said that they would only take it if she donated a huge trust fund for its upkeep. So she opened it on her own and set it up for people and maintained it. I don't know who owns it now, but for years it was just that family, one person her relative really doing descendant. all this out of the love to preserve that architecture. Somebody in her family not only owns it, but farms a thousand acres of it. Yeah. Did you notice there was no moss on the trees? A little. There was a little moss. She didn't like moss, oh. and or somebody didn't like moss who built Oak Alley, and they killed all the moss that had existed. The moss would have been dripping down like this from those trees, and they killed it. Well, by, before she bought it, they, it, I'm not going to give you a tour of Oak Alley, but before she bought it, they, the cow, I mean, the elements had moved in, including there was a whole herd of cows that were living in it. Yeah. And it took them yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars to clean up. Yeah. The manure, I don't know, a lot of people could have used that manure in their planting, but anyway. Well, a lot of the old plantation houses, New Orleans, um, Louisiana had many, many, my father told me when he was a boy, and you could go and explore them and roam through them and, and, and have, and when he did that sort of vagabonding around the state when he was a kid, and he said many of them just fell to ruin. There was no money to preserve them or save them, and nobody really wanted to. Right. And Louisiana has always been sort of economically depressed ever since before the Civil War, actually. It's never been an economically vital place like Atlanta. It's probably more vital today than it's ever been in its history since the turn of the 18th, 19th, 18th 19th century. But I'm, I'm glad these buildings have been preserved because I think, I think they're very beautiful. And there is another one down there. If you ever go down there, go to Maidwood. Maidwood Plantation is another one that was in total ruin when um, uh, Kitty Marshall moved into it and spent a fortune just renovating Maywood. And Maywood is open now. It's a bed and breakfast, and it's run by the Marshall family. And again, it's a labor of love, you know, yeah. really. It's beautiful. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was, the, when you wrote Prince Lestat, do you, I mean, what was the process of your writing Prince Lestat in, your, in relation to your writing the other books? Was it similar? Was it vastly different? Well, you know, each book, each book I write is different. Um, each one comes to me in a different way. But one of the problems with many of the books, for me personally, is that I envision a whole lot of the story. And a lot of characters come to life. And I don't know how to get into their world. I don't know where to begin. And always, the beginning is the hardest part. Mm -hmm. It's just the hardest part. And that's what happened with Prince Lestat. Lestat was back. I'd gone back and, and reread a lot of the Chronicles. I was hearing his voice again. He was talking. We were ready to go. There were all these other characters that were in there. Benji was a, you know, the vampire Benji had a radio station for vampires, and vampires were struggling with the modern world. And, and I, I had to figure a way to get into it. And finally, I just, I just did it. I just sat down and wrote. And it starts with, um, Lestat saying, I, hear, I heard this voice years ago, and I didn't know what the voice was. And, and then I switched from Lestat's point of view to the point of view of other characters who were converging um, on this one problem and this one challenge. And it was really like a pot just boiling over. You know, I, I had, to, I, so, much I, so much that I envisioned just never got into the novel, because it was already so chock full of characters mm -hmm. and story <clears> threads. And, stuff going on that I have a great deal now boiling up in the second book after, you know. Um, thank you. And, One and, fan for volume two. Yeah, but it's like, um, it, it's like I don't claim to be a neat writer or an organized writer. Right. Well, you know, I think, I'm, not, I think, I'm not a minimalist type writer, you know. But you know, I think all of that is about mess. 
It's about me. I mean, it's 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 yeah. messy. It's a messy process. Yeah, that's the kind of writer I am. I, I am a messy writer, and and I take great inspiration from other writers whom I think are messy and overwhelming and and uh, exciting in a messy way. You know. Are there other writers who messy writers who who influenced you or who you admire? Yeah, I hesitate to say they're messy though. I don't want to offend anybody. Okay. Uh, well, just other writers that you admire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I take inspiration from a lot of different writers for different reasons. Actually, we were talking earlier about how last time I came to Chicago, I went to Oak Park just to see where Hemingway had grown up and to walk around in the streets of Oak Park. And um, Hemingway was, is, is the very opposite of a messy writer. He's a completely neat, disciplined uh, writer. A minimalist, you know, an abstractionist of a writer. I'm an, exp an expressionist writer. Everything is, is full of my point of view and the point of view of the characters and their emotions and they're clashing together. And I aim very much for the feeling, I think, of real life flowing in the novel. The vampires are real to me. They're coming together. They're facing problems. I'm always amazed when somebody says, well, I didn't see any reason for that character. Why is that character there? And I thought, well, the character just came in, just the way people come in in life. I mean, what are you talking about? I mean, people tell me that about a character named Baby Jenks that I wrote into a novel called The Queen of the Dam. They said, why is she there? And I thought, well, that's, first of all, you're getting Baby Jenks' point of view on this, this holocaust that's happening in the vampire world. So she's telling you what's going on all over the world. And she's also, it's also, she's just one of them. They're all kinds of vampires. And again, it's, it's the messiness of, of life, the feeling of life, the rawness, the viscid quality of life that I'm always aiming for. But I've been criticized very much for not being neat, you know? I'm a kitchen sink writer. Everything but the kitchen sink is in you the mean, novel. You mean who? Oh, you mean neat in the in the structure or the? Well, in sure, the... sure. You know, but that that will always be the way it is. I mean. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't even imagine somebody criticizing somebody for for not being neat. I mean, mess but, mess is good. We yeah, like. Well, mess. there are all different ways to be a writer, and there are all different kinds of writers. That's I mean, right. There are I no rules. I don't consider Dickens a neat writer. I consider him a genius, you know, the writer of masterpiece novels, but I don't think they're that neat, you know. He did have an incredibly organized mind that he could pursue David Copperfield and Great Expectations right through the end like that. But there were, there were many things he did that were quirky and, and, and strange. And D.H. And Lawrence, I thought, very much that kind of writer, you know, not a neat writer but a genius, just an incredible genius. And I just read a best-selling author who I think is a bit like that too. Uh, I don't know if she would agree. I read all three of her books and I was amazed by her, what I see as her genius. And it's um, Gillian Flynn. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's done The Gone Girl and Dark Places. And I, I was just astonished because the writing is in some ways the very opposite of what, the way I, I see everybody as beautiful. I, I see every moment as sensuous. I'm, I'm knocked out by the sensuality of all kinds of aspects of life. And her writing is the writing of alienation and disgust and disappointment and almost um, nausea at, at the textures and smells and feelings of life. But it's just got this powerful energy. And I just am totally in love with Gillian Flynn. I want to read more of her stuff. Very powerful, very powerful writer. Yeah, very powerful. Um, all right, I'm going to, I have many more questions, but we don't have the time. So uh, you all are going to have to come back, and we're going to have to come back. <laughs> And I'm going to have to finish these questions. <laughs> um, and they were really fabulous questions, so what can I do? The thing is that we're, um, we're going to take questions from the audience. There are microphones, and um, somebody has microphones. Oh, okay. So if you have a question, and I hope a lot of people do, now is the time to raise your hand. Right here. Yes. Just had the pleasure of uh, hearing Charles oh, blow in it. this room an hour or two ago. In any okay. case, Charles said that people have this tendency to want to identify as homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual, and all of these boxes, and that he sees sexuality as a continuum and a spectrum, and there are hundreds of sexualities, mm -hmm. each of them for different reasons and different people. I wonder if when you stepped away from Anne Rice and Rodas, Rockwellaire, and did your erotica novels, were you in a different place? Did you step out of Anne Rice for a period of time, or was that just another flow or another phase for you? Oh, that's a really great question. I, I really did not step out of Anne Rice. Um, 
it's all part of what was going on in my mind, all part of who I was, and I really don't care about the gender of human beings. I've never had a strong sense of any gender myself, and I think I grew up in a sort of genderless world for various reasons, and um, gender is always a bit of a shock to me, and that people put so much weight on it, and people have to suffer so much over the issue of gender. And, and in, in my writing, uh, my characters, like Louis and Lestat, are, they completely transcend gender, and they're attracted to people of both sexes and, and even children, uh, obviously. And um, it's not directly erotic. It's, it's more love. It's more romance with the vampires. The erotic act is the act of drinking blood. But they really transcend gender. The idea of the dark gift becoming a vampire is that you transcend gender. You don't have to worry about gender anymore. You, you sense the worth of every human being, regardless of age or gender or how they look. They all have, for your vampire eyes, they all have a tremendous beauty and a compelling depth. And that's what motivates you as a vampire to seek victim after victim. And so when I went into the Rokalar novels, really the same thing prevailed. There were all men, it, there's no gender rules in the Rokalar novels. Men are with women, men, women are with women, men are with men, women uh, dominate men, men dominate women. No rules whatsoever. And it's the most natural way for me to write. To do, to do anything different, I'd have to consciously think about it. Um, that, that's who I am, that unrestrained, completely mad human being, actually. And um, I'm, very, I'm so thankful that early, at the very beginning of my career, I found Vicki Wilson and others who were completely okay with that, who could, never questioned it, never even brought up the topic. Um, never said anything about the outrageous erotic elements or, or um, disregard of gender in my work. So thank you for that question. I'm delighted to answer it. Okay, this woman here. Um, I actually had a question about Ramsey's The Damned. Sure. Um, a, what was your inspiration for writing Ramsey's The Damned? And B, do you have any plans to continue it in the future? Well, Ramses was actually written, I'll tell you how Ramses came about. I, I was visited by two Hollywood producers who wanted to know if I would write something for, for um, God, suddenly, uh, Richard Chamberlain. Richard Chamberlain was making a lot of miniseries at that time. He made Shogun and The Count of Monte Cristo, and he was very successful. And they said, well, could you write a supernatural series for him? So I sort of went home and thought up The Mummy. And I wrote actually a long sort of script, we called a Bible in Hollywood, where you write a sort of script outline of, of a series. And I wrote The Mummy in that form. And uh, it was never made, by the way. It never, it, it never worked out in TV land. But I kept the, what I call the literary rights to write my own novel based on it. And I did. And that was one reason I never wanted to publish it in hardcover. I wanted it in paperback because I saw it as something lighter. I wanted to call it an entertainment, originally written for television, but the publisher said, no, we're not going to do that, you know, this is going to be a book. So, all right, okay. But I wanted to make it clear that it was sort of a romp, it was a lark, it was a, it was a lighter novel. And eventually, I broke with those producers, uh, they did, weren't able to set it up, uh, it, it, a lot of bad stuff happened in Hollywood, but the novel, I had the novel. I mean, when you write a novel, you own that novel. You're, you're the art director, the producer, the star, everybody. It doesn't, and, and I was able to see it successfully published by Ballantyne, my paperback publisher. And it did, it's done very, very well over the years. And it's come very close to being made into a movie. But it keeps being the victim of, of rather strange occurrences. James Cameron wanted to do it. And we had actually talked on the phone about it. And he was doing this movie called Titanic. <laughs> and, <laughs> And the last time I talked to him, we were talking about whether the world really could take another movie about the Titanic, and I was assuring him they could. And then uh, Titanic became one of the greatest successes in movie history, and I never heard from James again. <laughs> but, I mean, this wasn't deliberate on his part. He just got busy, you know, with being an international success again, you know, as he'd been with Terminator or whatever, Terminator 2. And, and, that opportunity, it just never worked out. Meanwhile, The Mummy, you know, had been sold to a studio for James Cameron to 
direct and produce, and they did own it for 10 years, and it finally reverted back. But I, I might go back to it someday, but it's very much lighter in texture. It was written to be a paranormal romance before the word, the term ever existed, paranormal romance. And I think if I go back to Ramses and Julie, I will do it in the present time. I'll have some time gap. You know, they, I left them in the early 20th century, and um, I'd like to bring them into the 21st century. And, and have them have an adventure. But I, I don't know, I wouldn't say no to it, but I, I don't know when I'm gonna get to it, actually, is the question. Okay. Uh, so I first read your books when I was 13, 14 years old, some of the first books I read in English, and that was my first hero, and really imprinted on me, and as part of the you know, makeup of who I am today. And when I speak to people about your books, I hear that over and over again, that they first began reading them when they were so young. Could, could you talk up just a little bit? Thank Sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, most Great. of the people that I speak to, um, they read your books when they were so young, and it yeah. really imprinted on their personalities and laid such a groundwork for who they are today. And I'm wondering, how do you feel about the fact, I mean, the person sitting next to me today is 16 years old. How do you feel about the fact that your books are so important for people who are so young and really uh, define people's early experiences that way? I, I am just amazed and grateful, and I have been hearing this everywhere on this tour. Everywhere. I cannot tell you how many times people have come up and said they read them at age 11, 12, that their mother gave them the books at age 11, or their uncle gave them the book, and I, I had no idea. I mean, there had always been young readers. You know, somebody would come up at a signing and say, um, maybe a, a very uh, precocious nine-year-old, you know, would be reading Men Knock the Devil, and I'd be blown away, you know, why is theological questions. It was great. But on this tour this time, just about every single person is saying 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 is about the oldest that they're, they're actually mentioning. And I, I'm so thrilled. I'm so, I, I'm, I just don't know what to say. I'm so grateful that if, if the books have had that kind of influence, if young people have had the patience to read them and respond to them, I, I'm delighted. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. You know, I'm just glad. <laughs> Anybody? Oh, we have a question back here. Okay. Thanks. Um, two, two questions, please. Um, one, the word um, preternatural, ever since I remember reading that in an interview with the vampire, I mean, it's just, it's a word that I'm, as soon as I hear that word, I immediately think of your novels and just sort of if you have any early memory of sort of how that word came to be a I word do. that you used a lot. And then second, mm -hmm. um, Cry to Heaven actually is one of our favorites and wondering if you could tell us how you got interested in, in that topic. Okay, I'd be glad to. Preternatural was a word in a religion textbook that I had in the junior year in Catholic high school. Uh, it was a very wonderful textbook and preternatural was the word that the textbook used for the gifts that Adam and Eve had before the fall. It said they had preternatural gifts, not supernatural, but preternatural. They were immortal, they weren't aging. Um, those were preternatural gifts. And I just thought, that's one heck of a word, man. I really liked that word. And later when I was writing, long years later, when I was writing Interview with the Vampire, that word came back to me, preternatural. And I thought it was perfect because Lestat and, and Louis and Armand, my vampires, they're really not, you know, they, they don't, they don't shape shift and they don't turn into smoke and they don't turn into bats. I mean, they, they are really biological creatures that share the biological universe with us, but they have preternatural gifts. So they are immortal and they don't age. So that's the story on that word. And um, with regard to Cry to Heaven, I just stumbled over a description of the Castrati opera singers of the 18th century. And this was, um, something that just grabbed me. I was reading a book about history and I just read this description of them and what they were like, that they were the rock stars of their time and were super famous, but they were legally forbidden to marry. They were castrated at a young age, far too young to consent to anything. And, and they were castrated to preserve their magnificent voices. And they were castrated even before anybody knew whether they were gonna have a magnificent voice. So many were castrated and ended up in church choirs and others went on to become super opera stars who traveled all over Europe and were loved and worshiped by people. And I thought, what was that like to have that happen to you? That brutal, brutal an act happened to you and, and then to become world famous like Farinelli um, and then not be able to legally marry and, and, you, and you would be an outcast all your life. And, and 
I just had to write about them. I just had to go do a story about them. And people who were involved in the world of the arts who went through all of that, that interested me even more. I'd just written a novel before about the free people of color in Louisiana. Um, the, the quadroons, mulattoes, octoroons who had been uh, given their freedom often by a white father or grandfather and uh, lived in a very strange world between the black world and the white world in the antebellum south. And they had been outcasts, and yet they had often had a lot of property, been very rich, were very attractive physically, very, very much interested in the arts. They published the first book of poetry ever published in Louisiana. It was published by men of color in the 1840s. And um, I'd been intrigued for the same reasons. Here you have these outcasts. They have their own world. It's an outcast world. And I came to see with Cry to Heaven when I went to writing about the castrati, that that was my thing, kind of, was to write about outcasts, people that felt like monsters or had been told that they were monsters and that they could never be part of life. And yet they had struggled against this with all their might and main and made their lives as meaningful and rich as they could. So the vampires, the people of color, the castrati, to me, it was all one great continuity, one great flowing story about the human spirit. Do we have time for one more? We have more? time for one more right okay. here. Hi, Ms. Rice. Uh, I was wondering if um, you prefer writing longhand to typing or if you write one way to put you in a mindset versus another, if you think there are benefits of journaling versus just working at the computer. Well, actually, uh, I do all my, uh, my novel writing and fiction writing and almost all correspondence on a, on, a, on a computer and a keyboard. And I've always been a typewriter writer. You know, I've written, I wrote Interview with the Vampire on IBM typewriter that I still own. And um, writing took off for me when I got my first little portable typewriter in college in 1959. And um, I typed very, very fast. And when I was a struggling writer, my biggest problem was to afford a typewriter that would go fast enough for my keys. I typed at work in an office. And um, I've always created that way. But over the years, I've also kept a handwritten journal. And I write in it every day. I use Borum and Peace notebooks like many businesses used to use in the old days for ledgers. And they're well bound, and the paper's good quality. And I have them from 1972, I think, when I started really keeping them and saving them. And I like very much writing by hand. And I've taken copious notes and jotted out scenes for books, but I never actually really write any finished copy by hand. It's always the typewriter. But there's something I'd like to bring up about this. Uh, I've been thinking about it. It seems to me that for thousands of years, people wrote with only the right hand, right? They only wrote with one side of their brain. You pulled on one side of the brain, right hand. OK, in comes the typewriter, and suddenly people do what pianists do. They write with both hands. They're pulling on both sides of the brain. And there are therapists who tell us that this is significant if you're physically drawing on both sides mm -hmm. of your brain. There's a kind of touch therapy where you go through your memories and traumas and you're touched on different hands to make both sides of your brain process the memory and the trauma. But nobody has written anything about how this has affected writing. And it must have had an effect. The, the musicians who do this are pianists, keyboard musicians. They use both sides. But I think violinists really don't, you know. Well, maybe they do. I mean, they are using both, but not in the same way we are. We, we really use both hands when we type. So I'm waiting for somebody to study that. Don't you think that would be fascinating? <laughs> to see if, if, if there's something different about the novels from the, the dawn of the typewriter, because we're using both sides of our brain. But to get back to what you said, you know, that's what it, the way it works for me. I can go back and forth between one and the other. And that's the time we have for today. Let's thank Anne. It was wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>